Welcome back to the 21 Patriarch Edition. We have a very special panel for you today. It's the Family Law Panel. This is something people are pretty ignorant about, not kind of in our space, in our world, but when it comes to your next door neighbors, the people you work with, uh, just the normal folks in your neighborhoods, they, they don't know what's going on and how bad it is and they have no clue what to do. I think maybe a lot of us don't know what to do, but today we have people that aren't just uh, you know, theoreticians but practitioners, people of action, not just of words, that are actually involved in this world, doing something about it, and been doing something about it for a long time. So I want you to welcome first Jeff Younger, <laughs> Cornell Smith, and Melissa Isaac. So let's start this way with each of you. Just um, tell us a little bit about yourself and give us a minute or two on the work you're doing. Jeff? Well, um, my son, um, James, James has, and, and my other son, Jude, have been in the family court system since they were two years old. My wife filed for divorce to transition my son to a girl. And I've been fighting for eight years to stop that. Um, and the courts have essentially sided with her at every turn. I've been able to keep him from being chemically castrated and sterilized, but I, I have not been able to prevent his social transition to a girl. So he's presented to the world as a girl with an address and so forth. And the family courts repeatedly have overruled my parental rights and have had a total disregard for the best interests of my child. Thank you, Jeff. Carnell? Hi, I'm Carnell Smith. I'm also known as the paternity coach. Um, I've come through my experience in family law as being a dad who was fighting to ask a judge to enforce their own order so that I could see my son. I found that that experience was such that enforcement of making me pay was swift. Should I be late, there was no mercy. But in order to see my son, there was no help. And then a few years later, I found out from a lady who said, I'd never do anything like that to you. She lied and uh, managed to, to dupe me for 11 years out of child support for a kid that was her boyfriend's kid. And I fought this all the way to the United States Supreme Court. And uh, I became a legislative advocate in the, in the process of that. And, uh, helped get law changed in uh, probably about six states now. Uh, I won my own case after the U.S. Supreme Court turned me down uh, using the law that I wrote and also helped my state, Georgia, change their laws to what we call dual party responsibility. It used to be uh, single obligor, which meant typically dads paid most of the support. Now mom is required to participate too. Thank you so much. Melissa. I'm Melissa Isaac. I'm a um family law attorney and my, I limit my representation to just fathers, just men in, in family law matters. And I started this, I would say, you know, around not quite 15 years ago. This was really before these groups were formed. There was a lot of social media advocacy and it was a very lonely world. I think um, as Jeff and, and Carnell can both attest to that, it's a very lonely world when you're fighting something where you're going against the grain. So you know, in the last 15 years, family law, I want to say in some areas with a few judges has come a long way, but we have a, a still we have a long way to go. We're fighting against social and cultural norms in the legal world, and that's difficult to do. So that's what I do. One, one quick question for you. As I listened to Jeff and Carnell, they, they kind of had a pers personal connection to this world that yeah. brought them in. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have something like that? How did you get brought into this world? So I was raised by an <laughs> alienating mother. Um, a very abusive mother, and my mom is maybe four foot ten. She's she's tiny, and my dad just got home from Vietnam. He was a Marine, you know, six foot four. And as I grew up, everything she said was just taken as true. If she said it, the courts accepted it at the expense of my dad, at the expense of our relationship with him. So seeing, so being a child and coming up and seeing how these lies were accepted as truth, where the accusation was the evidence, and me thinking that's not, that's not justice, that's not how the court system is supposed to work. But her destructive decisions, the way they've impacted my life, the life of my sisters, it really motivated me to go into this area of the law to make a change. I'm glad you did. Um, sorry it came the way it did, but thankful. Thankful for you guys. So I didn't know anything about this. I had friends that went through some rough divorces, heard some stories here and there. But, um, and I think a lot of people don't. I think a lot of people have no clue what's going on. And some of the things they hear, they would say, there's no way that's true, right? It, it, that can't be. That sounds, that's an exaggeration, 
Right. Uh, so what I'd like to start with, with all three of you guys, is uh, let's drop some red pills. Right. Let's wake some people up to reality uh, and speak to your, your uh, speak to me 10 years ago when I knew nothing about this. Uh, wake up some normies. What what how would you introduce people uh, into the reality that you're fighting right now? Starting with you, Jeff. Well, um, I, I kind of could give it to you the way I sort of discovered it, in, you know, in court, because um, I went into court very naive and thinking it was going to be a fair process, too. First of all, I didn't know that district court judges are probably the most powerful people you elect. Um, we talk a lot about how they can suppress speech and uh, their contempt powers, which are virtually unlimited. You can get life in prison on contempt, right? Um, we talk about that, but they have a very have another power which we don't talk about. They have the power to compel speech. They're the only elected official that can compel speech for which you can be punished hmm. if you utter that speech. And can you get an example of that real quick? Sure, absolutely. So um, the whole process uh, uh, leading up to a family court action, you know, to a trial. In, in Texas, we have jury trials for this, thank goodness. Um, it's, about, it's all about getting damaging character admissions, even if they're really irrelevant to the case. And they can, uh, it's very difficult for you to claim a Fifth Amendment privilege on that because there's really no criminal that's why I was just wondering how to get around the fifth. Yeah. So they can compel all kinds of speech and then twist it later and turn them into these unfounded accusations that we just heard about. Um, the second thing is that it is a system. I, I finally figured out it was a system. And it's a system that starts at the federal government. And it's two laws, Title IV-D and Title IV-E, where the federal government literally pays the states billions of dollars to remove fathers from homes and they only get the money if they remove the father from the home. And so that was a law uh, passed, uh, uh, signed by Gerald Ford from a Democrat Congress. So both parties have a, a, you know, a fault here. Yep. Um, and it's, it's devastated uh, this country. It has literally uh, uh, created a situation in which the states uh, uh, fund fatherlessness. Carnell, I've heard you talk about that a little bit. Could you, could you uh, what is it? Uh, 4D some section. Yeah. Can yeah. you explain that a little bit more to both the audience and the people watching? Sure, sure. Thanks for the opportunity. So the Social Security Act um, is more than just helping seniors. It has become somewhat of a uh, gold mine where states pander to get uh, financial money for running their child support enforcement system. And I dare say it also funds a lot of the judges' retirement funds. So I think, you know, just from my experience of multi going to multiple states, sometimes this tends to color uh, what should be a fair and impartial rendering of a judgment. It doesn't pan out. So specifically looking at Section 458 under this Title 4D, it's called uh, Bonus and Incentives to the States. And what it does I mean, is just that phrase angers yeah, me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and it, some people try to tell me, so that can't be true. Like, yeah, your tax dollars finance a system that will work against you. And any thoughts that you had going in that it was a level playing field, you're in for shock and awe. Mm -hmm. A couple of key metrics that they use um, in terms of what the states will compete for to the extent of willing to overlook and down. In fact, they will stomp on your civil rights if you don't fight back. And one of those metrics is based on the number of paternities they get established each year not fathers, paternities. Now, this can be done by- Make that, distinct, make that distinction between fathers and paternity for people yes, that, yes, so they yes. understand what the ca categorical differences are. All right. So my, my experience with men and women around the United States, when you say father, they think this is the person who fertilized the egg that resulted in the pregnancy. So it's implied, inferred, thought of as biological father. However, there were techniques that have been developed that you can get him established as the legal father, which then gives you access to his resources. And then if he doesn't make some swift decisions, he can't opt out. Even if genetic testing later reveals he's been duped, he's been swindled, he's been tricked. And then they'll say, well, it's your fault you didn't find out sooner. And my, my, uh, my meme is called Cupcake. Cupcake laughs and says, well, hey, it's his fault he didn't know the rules. Yeah. And the so, next metric that they have is 
the states want to get in on the bonus pool money, right? And, and think about it. Some of the opposition I've had has come from the family bar section who I thought, well, well I thought the lawyers stood for truth. I thought they stood for fairness and justice. And like, nope, they're going to give an aggressive representation for their clients. So if they're representing mom, we can have you coming in trying to change the laws that say the judge's discretion should be eliminated or limited. But I'm thankful that there are a lot more women on the side of honesty when they see what happens to their sons, husbands, boyfriends, grandsons. They finally figured out the thing was rigged. And then when you show them how to use their voice and represent themselves legislatively, we're getting things done. That's great. Melissa, you only represent men, fathers mostly. Um, so uh, when they come into your office, they're probably incredibly naive and you have to wake them up what's ahead of them. How do you prep men for what they're about to go into? What are some of the steps, some of the things they need to know um, that they probably don't when they walk through the door? Well, unfortunately, a lot of men come in and they say, I want my day in court. I want the judge to know exactly what she's been doing, how she's been treating me, how she treats the kids. And I kind of say, wait a minute, it's rare you find a judge who gives a shit, okay? It's rare, they don't care. They care about moving cases off their docket. They want their docket to stay clean. Very few care about the actual relationship between fathers and children post-separation, post-divorce. Very few care about that. So I, I, I want them to understand that. I want them to understand that you, you can fight for your day in court. You can get in there. You can have a great case. You can have great evidence. And you can still lose because this judge doesn't care. The judge might be friends with opposing counsel. The law firm of that judge, or of that law firm may have contributed to the, the campaign of the judge. There are so many factors that are involved in litigation, in justice, right, that have nothing to do with justice. So what I do is I, I, I like you use your word red pill, I red pill them right away, all right? Don't think that the court system cares anything about your relationship with your child, which is in the best interest of these children. So we have these laws that are written and, you know, it's crazy. We have these big books and they have all these laws in there and there's pages and pages of laws. The laws, you know, the judge must X, Y, Z, the judge must. And then there's, then they end it with, or whatever the judge thinks is in the child's best yeah, interest, right. okay? Mm -hmm. Which kills you on appeal, essentially. Yeah. So I let them know up front, really, I try to lower their expectations. That's brutal. Yeah, yeah it is. The, lever of, uh, the, the levers of power are never what people think they are because of TV, because of media, uh, because of just kind of fo folklore and mythology that exists in our culture. Uh, you guys have been in this battle for a long time. Right. Um, you know, you know some of the buttons to push, the things to go after. What are those things? Let's say for a dad, let's say a dad, let's start with the dad that is losing access to his child. Where would you start, Jeff? Where would you tell that guy? So let, look at my case. Um, you know, I got less than standard possession. So this is another fascinating aspect of this. Um, the beginning of a case will usually start with what's called a custody evaluator and they're going to be a psychologist and they're going to determine what the relationship is between the parents and then they make a recommendation so since we have no fault divorce the psychologist custody evaluator essentially functions to assign fault in the divorce for the court mm -hmm. and they give cover for the judge to do what the judge wants and they have the judges have relationships with them so the first thing that i think um, you know that was important that i would have done differently is i would have insisted on having an independent the evaluator in addition to the court ordered one it, which can the, you insist upon that is you, that something you you can you got to pay for it but you can mm -hmm. and um, so let me give you an example of what the court ordered uh, custody evaluator did to me so as you know my ex-wife for eight years has been trying to transition my son so he asked me what are your top three issues in this divorce that I need to look at and I said my number one issue is that my ex-wife is tampering with my son's gender identity he found that I made a false accusation about her because that wasn't true. And on the basis of that false accusation gave me less than standard, I had less possession than convicted felons. So was the, the angle is that she's not tampering as much as she's like embracing or? No, he literally lied to the court and said she's raising him as a boy, just normally. Just lied. He literally lied. And um, why did he do that? 
He did that because uh, courts uh, are actually given quotas. Family courts are given child support quotas before they hear any evidence in cases. Hmm. So judges have a pool of child support they have to assign in their cases, and they allocate that to each case. And they pick and choose a winner and a loser parent based on who can pay that money, hmm. right? The judicial retirement fund in my state comes out of that money. So their retirement depends on how much child support they issue. The Texas Attorney General's office is completely funded by these Title IV-D uh, child, child support reimbursements to the tune of half a billion dollars. That's crazy. So there, when you put half a billion dollars on the table, you got a lot of special interests going after that money. So, that's the, so the first thing is getting the custody evaluator and understanding the incentives. And then in, in my case, we have elected judges. So judges respond to electoral pressure. So one of the things that these courts will do is put unconstitutional gag orders on you so you can't tell the electorate what the elected officials doing in the, in the course of their official duties. Mm. I have simply refused to follow those. Now, I've paid a price for that. But um, I, have just not, I don't follow unconstitutional orders from the court, and they never enforce them on me because they would lose on a writ of habeas corpus to the Texas Supreme Court, and it would look bad for them, even worse to their electorate, right, for imprisoning an innocent man. But they do this, and most fathers follow those. I have, inf I have uh, informed the electorate, which has allowed me to keep my son from being chemically castrated. I guarantee you, had I not violated those gag orders and told mm -hmm. the people what the judges were doing, mm -hmm. he would be sterilized right now. Yeah. <sighs> Melissa, how do you, what have you learned when it comes to navigating uh, courtrooms? Um, some of the issues that Jeff brought up. I, I, you have a, we got Jeff, who's the one that is trying to defend his son. You're the sort of person that defends people like Jeff or aids them. Uh, what's some things that you could open our eyes to? I think the most important thing when navigating a courtroom is when the legal standards are weak, your evidence has to be strong. And in Alabama, it's a one-party state. It means you can record conversations if only one person to the conversation knows it's been recorded. I tell my clients to record everything. When you meet with a guardian ad litem, you record it. When you meet with a, a therapist, you record it. You record everything because like Jeff said, they will lie. Yep. Now these people are, they're professionals. They're, they're, they have certifications, they have, they lie, right? So, and that's a big misconception I think that the, the people have is, well, these are professionals. I mean, this is a mental health professional. This is a lawyer. No, they don't lie. Listen, some of the worst people I've ever met in my life wear black robes. All right? They call themselves doctors, they call themselves psychologists, some of the worst people. So don't ever give anybody any credit just because of the, the credentials that they possess at all. So when someone comes in and says, well, you know, I met with the dad and the dad said X, Y, Z, is that, is that what he said exactly? Okay. Because when I go in the courtroom with recordings, I have recordings queued, I have transcripts for the court. Here you go, judge, so you can follow along. And for that reason, and I'm glad, by the way, there are some mental health professionals that won't speak to me unless it's in writing, which, by the way, I prefer that anyway, right? Because we, that's what <laughs> we want. We <clears throat> can't change your story. It is what it is. So when you're navigating through the courtroom, let me tell you something, especially as a man, you do not want to be in a he said, she said no. position. No. You will lose every time. Yes. What I have found in my career, women tend to be better actors than men. Women can turn on the tears. I mean, you know what? Like, Not Amber Heard, though. She's pretty. Oh, well, that, like, she's for pretty being rough. an actress, she was a horrible actress. Like, she did a horrible job, right? She gets the rotten tomato. But, you know, we go into the courtroom and we have social media posts. We have the, 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 the sexting pictures between her and the boyfriend. But yeah, when she comes into court, she's dressed very conservative. Always a string of pearls. Mm -hmm. That's odd to me. But mm -hmm. always a string of pearls, a little tissue in the right hand. But then you hit play, right? When she's in there and she's talking about how important church is and how important family is, and I'm just here to protect my children from, you know. But then when her F-bombs start bouncing off the courtroom walls, when you can hit record, play on that recorder, change, it's a game changer. Yeah. Okay? So you look at the Court of Appeals, it, it's hard to win at the Court of Appeals, right? Um, you have to show that the judge abused your discretion or the, the great weight of the evidence doesn't you know, comport with what the judge did. <clears throat> But it can be done. Mm. We actually have, you know, my firm, 
we have a good appellate rate, okay? Not because we're these just, just fantastic lawyers, but because we do a thorough job. We do a good job. We understand what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. So that would be my advice to you when you're navigating a courtroom is everything you say, everything you testify to, back it up by a witness, mm -hmm. and text message, an email, a recording, something. Mm -hmm. Do not get stuck in a he said, she said situation. Completely. Mm -hmm. Carnell, um, people sometimes say that men are the disposable sex. And what they don't realize, the reason that women and children go first off a boat isn't because we're disposable, but because we care about our legacy more than anything. Men care about uh, our children, they're our future. We're willing to die for them. Mm -hmm. I hate listening to you speak because, but I do it. Let me explain why. Um, having men promise the legacy and then them finding out that um, these children, who are still beautiful children, mm -hmm. but he's been sacrificing his life for, and he would die for them in a second, right? Every dad would. Is not his child. Uh, he's been deceived um, by a woman who claims to be faithful, claims to love him. Uh, it's church-going women, in many cases, right? It's not just um, some sort of like strung-out person, but these are these are people. Again, they're string of pearls. They present well. Uh, it's very hard to hear that, uh, but I think it's something people need to know. It's been a reality for a long time, and it's one that's, um, that's undeniable uh, based on evidence. How, what's some of the evidence that shows that this is actual, not just some random every once in a while thing, yeah. but this is a, a growing trend in our country and a real problem? Okay, so you're speaking specifically on some data that's that's beyond just some uh, one-off situations. Yeah, beyond an anecdotes. Yeah. yeah. So in my in my process of working with legislators across the nation, they always come back with this question. Well, eh, it's only a, a small problem with 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 a few minorities, yep. uh, low-income minorities at that. <clears throat> and then when I show them billionaires who are paternity fraud victims, multimillionaires, elected officials, men in every branch of the armed forces clergymen, scientists, you name it. Because oftentimes moms will pick a guy based on some criteria who she thinks is the best father candidate and the truth about whether or not he's really related to the kid, no, 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 no. You understand how hypergamy, how hypergamy works. She's looking to get the best candidate to help her with her goals, the heck with what he wants or needs. For a lot of guys, their belief that legacy is it. He's investing in what he believes to be his own progeny, and he's willing to go to the ends of the earth for them. Now, I will also say that in getting data, I asked the various um, state contracted laboratories who provide services by contract and say, okay, how many men are you testing, have tested over the past three calendar years? And of those you have tested, how many of them prove to not be related to the child. And again, and again, and again, year after year, this number is 30% or better. Um, there's one county in Michigan, um, I think men have gotten a memo. They've gotten a memo that trust but verify. Yeah, she says you did it. Yeah, you were married to her. Yes, she's your high school sweetheart. But in that county in Michigan, 80% of the guys who got tested were not related to the child. Wow, that's so incredible. So in, in, in my radical thinking, you know, I've been called a troublemaker by a few uh, women, women groups and the womenist, feminist mindset. They're like, but you're, you're trying to make DNA tests into weapons against women. I was like, no, 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 I'm not really. I'm trying to help you. I said, as your, your, your ideology says, you believe in equality, right? And I'm like, go girl, you get equality, but you also must take the rest of the medicine. That includes equal responsibility and equal accountability. So if you are parallel dating while your husband thinks he's in a monogamous relationship, you should have an ethical moral duty to disclose that so he can make a formal, uh, fully informed decision about whether or not your actions say that you're for the streets. He should believe you are for the streets based on your conduct and he should return you to the streets. That's my position. I don't care if she's the pastor's wife or whether she's an elected official. Listen, I've even come across women who were college professors who also committed paternity fraud. No guy believes me initially, and some men have even laughed at me in my presentation. 
he goes and do DNA testing and one guy finds out three out of five of the kids weren't his. And those three kids had different fathers. Mm. So who was the person who did wrong? It wasn't him. So a guy goes to Afghanistan for 13 months and his wife uh, has an, uh, gets pregnant and has a new son while he's away for 13 months. Mm -hmm. He says that's not possible. Uh, humans aren't elephants. Yep. It's nine months in there, <laughs> right? Okay. Um, and uh, so he files for divorce. Yeah. While he's away, open and shut, right? He's not going to have to pay child support. It's not all going to be fine, right? Not true. All right, why don't you not true. explain how this, how this could be possible? How a okay. woman could clearly, like, he's not mailing sperm to her. No. Uh, so no. How's, how, how in the world can a man be paying for a child that's clearly not his scientifically. Right, right. Like, all right, so shed great some question. light. Yeah. So great question. It, there's this doctrine called the Lord Mansfield Doctrine. It's from the early 1800s. And it's based on old English common law. And what that doctrine said essentially is that um, unless the man was away on the high seas or otherwise his equipment didn't work, he is presume to be the father of every child that his wife has while he's married to her. Now, at least back in that time, if he was away on the high seas, he was essentially uh, had no access to her, right? Mm -hmm. But now uh, there's been a somewhat of a perverted twist to the thing by the states that support the marital presumption of paternity. So even if he is deployed in active combat duty, while he's still married to her, and everyone knows she's living with the boyfriend, and the boyfriend's name got initially placed on the birth certificate, his name will be removed and the husband's name will be put on there. And if, these, if the guy doesn't fight this thing like rapidly, a fatal mistake a lot of guys do, they'll just walk away and then try to divorce her by, through the mail or by default and not take the critical step to get evidence. Still, look, we know you physically weren't here during the gestation period. Women don't gestate like elephants do, right? Not possible. But in those states and countries that support the marital presumption, it doesn't matter whether you're in the country, out of the country, you found out she had multiple boyfriends, you said, I'm not touching her with a 10-foot pole. Mm -hmm. The judge says, according to the law, you are responsible for any children she has while you're still married to her, so ordered. And that blows the mind of a lot of people. So it's good. Look, it's patently unfair on its face, mm -hmm. right? And what I say to the, to the womanist, feminist supporters, like you guys should be cheering for the boyfriend to get to take care of his kid. Now, if she was a rational woman, why didn't she divorce her husband? Her actions say she don't love him. Her actions say she doesn't want to be in that relationship. However, she wants to be attached to his resources. A lot of times that guy's been selected, but why? He's a studious, he's hardworking, he's a go-getter. He might not be the Chad or, or a Tyrone who turns her on, right? So how does she do it? She does it get the best of both worlds. I like that you did Chad and Tyrone. Yeah. And we yes. both know you're just covering the spectrum here. I am, so, I am. <laughs> <laughs> Melissa, um, you, you've been involved in paternity fraud cases. Uh, what's, uh, what's some eye-opening cases that you've been involved in? Oh, probably the, the saddest cases are, because like Carnell was saying, the law is so one-sided when it comes to who is the legal father, is mother would have an affair, boyfriend finds out she's pregnant, boyfriend really wants to be a daddy. But then husband steps in and says, nope, I'm, I'm the legal father. And having to fight we, we can prove that we're the biological father. You can prove that it, it may not matter. But see, a lot of this comes down to the, the politics of your judge, your, your specific judge. So like most of the judges, I, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't let them babysit my dog, but there are a couple judges that when these situations come in, I look at the judge and I'm like, we got, we got one of the two good judges in the whole state. We got one of the two. So there was a case where something similar happened where the judge almost actually played a mediator, kind of pre-tried the case and said, listen, I'm not gonna kick this dad out of this child's life. I'm not going to. You can take me to the Court of Appeals. You can take me up, but I'm not doing that. Where well, we actually were able to reach agreements. So 
a lot of, most of the time, well, I will say when a husband finds out that wife is pregnant with someone else's baby, most of the time the husband will be like, their, their, their marriage is kind of over anyway. Yeah. But there are some of those men that will stay and hang on for some reason, I don't mm. know, right? Maybe the sex is good, but crazy mm. in the bed, crazy mm. in the head. I've yet to see an <laughs> exception, right? But some of these men tend to, 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 to latch on. Yeah. Why, I don't know. But the law is so horrible when it comes to that. Mm. You know, and, and I just wanna switch gears real quick. We look at, you know, some people are saying, hey, the divorce rates are going down. This is a good thing. No, okay? The marriage, Men, rates, the marriage the rates, rates are going, going down, down as well, right? Yeah. So there's less yeah. divorce rates. But it doesn't necessarily mean that less babies are being born. Right. Mm -hmm. So I had a case, of course, this, this, this woman gets pregnant, dad comes in, hey, I, I want to be a dad. Mm -hmm. The first thing I tell them, and Carnell can tell you this, you want to sign the putative father registry so, yep. or the responsible father registry. Yep. So in Alabama, we, you know, I, it was funny because I had a case and I was talking to this guy who, um, this other attorney, and I'm just bashing. I'm like, who wrote this piece of shit legislation? Some dipshit wrote this. Like, I'm having a very candid conversation, okay? It was him. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, he, he was laughing. He said, actually, I, I wrote it, and I said, wow. Well, it still stands, and you're, you're the dipshit. This is yep. shit legislation. <laughs> right but, so he's, it, what, it's called the pants up doctrine, okay? As soon as a man pulls his pants up, he knows that there's a chance that he should be this child's, he could be this child's father. He needs to get on the registry and say, hey, I have to sign this registry with the state of Alabama saying, I so-and-so slept with so-and-so. Mm -hmm. If she has a child, I might be this child's father. I said, well, that doesn't make any sense, mm -hmm. right? Why isn't there a panties up doctrine, yeah. right? Yeah. When these women lay on their backs with their legs wide open, mm -hmm. sleeping with God knows who, shouldn't they be the ones to have to report and say, you know, I slept with so-and-so. And wouldn't it be so much easier for the state to yeah, figure that out? She knows out? who's on the list. She knows. She knows better than anybody else Absolutely. who this baby's father should be mm -hmm. or could be. Mm -hmm. But why do we put the responsibility on men? Why? Because it's socially acceptable to say, that man can't keep his dick in his pants. Mm -hmm. But is it socially acceptable to say, this woman lays on her back with her legs wide open mm -hmm. for every man that walks through her door? kind of makes you cringe a little bit to say that, right? Mm. But you know what, but I, but I can, right, yeah, it makes yeah. you cringe. Mm -hmm. But it's no different than saying a man can't keep his dick in his pants. Mm -hmm. But why can I say it and not Carnell? Mm -hmm. Why can I say it and not Jeff? Mm -hmm. Somebody needs to say it. Mm -hmm. So I'll say it. It makes you cringe, but it's the truth, yeah. right? So you look at these babies being born out of wedlock, and these men will come in, bless their heart, and they say, look, I had this baby being born, this is my son. I'm like, you have to understand, that this child is no more your son, yeah. then mm -hmm. he's my son. Mm -hmm. okay? You are no more this child's father than the chair sitting in that corner right there because the law won't acknowledge it. Exactly. So then you have to go through this huge process of establishing paternity before the court will even consider giving you any time with this child. Yep. It's a long process. Mm -hmm. It's a very long process, an expensive process. How many dads didn't get to see their children over COVID because, well, we're not yep. scheduling hearings because of COVID. Absolutely. So, I mean, family court, it's a show. It's a shit show. That's it's what weird. kind of court it is. You want to do everything you can to stay out of it, mm -hmm. right? So casual sex, irresponsible sex, unprotected sex, it's mm -hmm. dangerous to you as men. Absolutely. It's dangerous. Jeff, what do people not understand about uh, parental cust or custody of children? After a breakup in a, a relationship or divorce, what do they not understand? Uh, you're a smart guy, especially for Eastern Orthodox, you're doing all right. Um, but, uh, but, uh, <laughs> um, and, you know, we all, we all have salt in our past, but you're, um, You've done well for yourself, but you still found yourself in a situation um, where you don't have access to your son. Um, how did that happen uh, from a legal standpoint? What can people learn from about custody from your situation? Okay, so you've heard about this paternity fraud issue. And once you can accept that, that the courts will do this, that they will literally take 30% of a man's gross income, pre-tax income, which even millionaires and businesses can't survive. Mm -hmm. And they'll do that for 24 years for a child that's not, and the courts are willing to do that kind of thing to men. 
um, you start to think courts can do other things. So let me tell you the, the simplified version of how they took uh, custody away from me. The judge issued an unconstitutional gag order. And I've repeatedly told the judge to please put me in jail for it. Because I'm never following it. I have a writ of habeas corpus. I want, I'll appear in handcuffs at the Fifth Appeals District. She'll come in her judge robes. And we'll see who's right about this, right? Because I have a permanent lifetime ban from all media. Mm. Okay, that's Jeff, this is going online. Yeah, right. I know. I know. I, tell, I look in the camera and tell her all the time. I know. So, so that's the first thing. They issued an unconstitutional gag order. When I didn't follow the gag order, opposing counsel got a psychologist to say that me talking about my son with other people like my church and so forth to get support for my church was harming my son. So then, they, then the judge reasoned like this. I issued the unconstitutional gag order on Mr. Younger. Mr. Younger is not following the unconstitutional gag order that was entered in the best interests of his son. Therefore, Mr. Younger is not acting in the best interests of his son. Therefore, I will give him less possession time than convicted pedophiles. Mm. That's how the judge reasoned. And what that should illustrate to you is that at, at law, district judges have almost unlimited discretionary power over you in family court. Mm -hmm. I'll give you some other examples that men just don't know about um, mm -hmm. that affects custody. Mm -hmm. um, you have no financial privacy. Like every credit card transaction that I'm making here at this, will be, it'll be scrutinized by a judge. Mm -hmm. And that will happen until my sons are 26. Mm -hmm. Okay, you have no financial privacy. If you start a business, all of your business partners are exposed to this as well. Okay, so you're, it circumscribes the ways that you can make money to fund a legal defense to go after custody. And that's done intentionally, right? Mm -hmm. So the other thing is that while they talk about custody being, uh, you know, in Texas there are statutes that say, you know, uh, ch uh, children have a right to an enduring, consistent relationship with their parents, right? Mm -hmm. But this is really subject to the judge's determination of the best interest of the child. And let me tell you how the courts have misinterpreted that doctrine. Mm -hmm. um, and the lawyer here can talk about Troxel later, but. Mm -hmm. um, Troxel, be great. Yeah, so. Troxel? It's a, yeah. it's a Supreme Court case, that, okay. yeah. So, um, the, certainly the statutes in all the states uh, give, say that the judge should rule in the best interest of the child. What they don't say, what those statutes do not say, is that the judge determines what the best interest of the child is. Yeah. That is still left with a fit parent. It's called a fit parent presumption. And one of the worst abuses that even the paternity front stuff, all this is based on the idea that these district judges just ignore the fit parent presumption and decide how parents are going to raise their kids and they're just going to make the parents pay for it and do all the work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that becomes an ideological decision because there's no general agreement in this country on how we ought to raise our kids. A Muslim Because would of have multiculturalism. Multiculturalism. Yeah, exactly. Globalism. Uh, that's right. A Muslim will have a very different idea than an Orthodox <clears throat> Christian, right? Mm -hmm. I have a very different idea, obviously, than my ex-wife who thinks my son should be a girl versus being a boy. Now you, you would think that courts would s sort of pick between what the two fit parents are and choose one of those, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but they don't. What they do is they manufacture the way they would raise the child, right? And that applies to custody. So the, the district judge basically does this, psychologically does this. I don't like that parent and um, if, I were, if I were in this situation, I wouldn't want that parent to have time and so I'm gonna give time to the other parent. Mm -hmm. It comes down a lot to likability and, and likability comes down to whether you're politically and socially congruent with the judge. So I have a, a far left judge, very far left judge, radical actually far left judge. I'm clearly not congruent, socially congruent with her. And so she's determined that uh, people like me can't raise their kids and she has the power to do it because district judges are just that powerful. The best interests of a child, um, part of the problem so I'm a pastor, and um, and I try to speak to the moral issues. I don't think I don't think there's any hope without a moral populace. But I also think when a hurricane has destroyed a town, you pick up where you can pick up. You start, you know, we all have our different place in the rubble here and trying to rebuild something. Um, so uh, I've had a lot of men uh, reach out to me who've gone through terrible divorces, uh, uh, very painful custody battles. Good good men, pastors who. Uh, I, I know one pastor whose wife um, 
she got really in shape. He's a good dad. I'm sure he made mistakes like any dad, you know, right? Worked too much for a couple months or whatever, but, but a good man. Um, she got really involved in Instagram and then got into the fitness world and started hooking up with a coach. And then uh, the pastors disciplined him for not loving his wife like Jesus would. And I'm like, Jesus says in Revelation, he'll spit you out if you don't repent. You know, Jesus will send you straight to hell, okay? Um, so I don't know what you're talking about. Um, he goes through all that. I can coach him through that. I can coach him through the church stuff. I can walk him through scripture. But then he gets into the courts, and I don't know what to do. I don't know. I don't understand this world. Um, but, you know, my position is I'm trying to get men to be fathers and get married because that's where, that's what stabilizes society. But guys are saying, what all, you know, what in the world? Why would I do that to myself? Like these, you know, that's what I mean with your presentations is that it's, it's uh, truth speakers cause pain. And I'm glad you do it, you know. But um, so we've talked about the moral depravity. We've talked about the corruption of the court, the problems of the court. At least we started scratching at the surface here. What do we do about it? Like how, how, do, how, do, how do guys like me and people in here, you guys are advocates. I know you guys are not making much money from this. I know that for a fact. That's not why you're here. Uh, you're here because you're an advocate. So what do we do? How do we get involved? What are some steps? Melissa? Well, you know, you said you, you look at the issues of morality. The courts, by statute, look at morality. But like Jeff said, what is morality is determined by your judge. Right? So we think, well, morality is, is commitment. Morality is... Ex, you know, exclusivity within a relationship. You don't have sex with anybody else other than your spouse whether you're in this relationship. But if you have a, you know, pretty liberal judge, especially these female judges, but what if she's not satisfied? Mm. It would be harmful for her to stay in that relationship. And you know what? And he should want her to go be satisfied. So, I mean, what, what, what's moral no, anymore? True. Yeah. Exactly true. Yeah. yeah. No, it's, what, it's wicked. And, and this, what sounds, it is, yeah. this sounds so far out there. But, and this really ties into the presentation I'm going to give later, because it, it, we're litigating excuses. That's what we do. We litigate excuses. We litigate justifications as to, well, I did, I may have done this, but it's his fault. And this is why. This is what he was doing. This is what he wasn't doing. I mean, I didn't feel like I had a choice other than to fall into the arms of another man. Right? <laughs> oh. so, so that's the thing, is we look at morality. It's not even okay. It's, no, you're not even safe if you meet somebody at church anymore. You're not safe if you meet somebody at church. The hypocrites that sit in church on a Sunday and then for the rest of the week tear apart families, oh, but they go to church on Sunday. Oh, that's nice. Religious but, duty. Exactly. The woman in Proverbs uh, chapter 7, when she's seducing the man, one of the things she says is, I've made my offerings, right? She said, I made my offerings. She is actually a religious woman, uh, but she tears down households and destroys them. And it's not just that. So this has been going on for a while. It's Solomon, Solomon's trying to make his son wise. And it's hard for people. To, yeah, yeah, there are deadbeat dads, and there's manipulating moms, right? Lying moms as well. So, but to um, to you're, you're driving at a point, Melissa. Um, I want you to get there. So, he, so the question is, you know, what what do we do about this? And we're dealing with morality. Mm -hmm. And there's one thing that I try to do in courts is we point out the hypocrisy, mm -hmm. right? So. This is what she says. This is the, the presentation she gives to the public. This is what she says she wants. And this is where the recordings come in, all right? Evidence. So you point out the hypocrisy. Well, you say this, but you did this. You're a hypocrite, aren't you? No. Mm -hmm. No. Well, describe to me how you're not a hypocrite. I don't understand yeah. what you're saying because the judge has to understand where you're coming from. They have to believe you, by the way. So you point out the hypocrisy. Right? Where, well, I, I mean, I, I'm a moral woman, okay? Just like we'll talk about later, I'm going to talk about. We have a woman, she went to church three times a week. But it was okay for her to have an affair. Does it say that in the Bible? Um, I, I, don't, I don't think it does. <laughs> I'm glad you thought about that. You should have thought about that before. But you want to point out the hypocrisy, again, when you're, when your legal standard is weak, your evidence must be strong. Mm -hmm. Carnell, what's some steps? What's some ways uh, the folks on the street get involved? So two, twofold, twofold. I think that men have, and have to learn about a mindset shift that when they start to approach that family arena, it is not a level playing field. 
and he's got to start thinking strategically and he's got to be open to being coachable to an outside expert. To me, a family law attorney who's committed to helping you have frequent, consistent, quality contact with your kid is golden because they know legal strategy, they also know the lay of the court, and, and you're at an extreme disadvantage because one, you don't know the rules of the court, you don't know the rules of evidence, you don't even know the freaking language. <laughs> so I asked the guys, I said point blank, how could you aggressively represent your interests when you don't even know what they're talking about, mm -hmm. about you and your case, and you're still trying to do he said, she said. So it's, you're gonna need some mindset help, all right? Mm -hmm. But now, on the other side of that coin, there's opportunities to limit and eliminate judicial discretion by changing the law. And that, that involves some, some advocacy to the point of helping people see that you say you want dads and, and parents to have frequent, consistent, ongoing relationship with their kids and not one person playing one upsmanship and using the child like a pawn, right? To manipulate this other person to doing what they say he should do, right? Showing those people how to use their voice and influence legislators. What I've seen happen over the past decade, a lot more of the younger judges were the kid mm. who was affected by a malicious mom who nuked their relationship with their dad. And they are a lot more sympathetic to holding moms to task and not just believe all women. I've literally watched women say, no, 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 you're not gonna play that crap here in this courtroom. Says you're gonna, Wipe your face, you need a minute to compose yourself, and you're gonna answer this question today, mm. all right? I'm over there literally going, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But here's something else that people can do. Um, I approached the faith-based community for court watch. So, well, what is court watch? You need some people who have some, high, some, some very high standing in the community to sit in as observers on your court case and have them take notes. That has twofold purpose. One, I believe in prayer power, all right? I really do. It is why I'm a free man today and not facing a felony prison sentence for a pregnancy I didn't commit, all right? But the other thing is, now when you start calling for public testimony before the legislators, it is not just your story before the legislators. You got community leaders who have done court watch and seen multiple cases and believe me, they start to see some common recurring things, whether it be married, whether it be single, and they're like, well, wait a minute. The guy had 80% custody before he went in that courtroom. He walked out with once every other week and once every, every other weekend. How was that good for the kid? Believe it or not, showing people how to get involved in the legislative process how to use your voice and not just be a victim who just lays on the railroad track and take it. You can be effective if you learn how to do it. Mm -hmm. And I, my, my father used to tell me, he said, you might need some expert help. You don't lose your man card cause you go get some help. Mm -hmm. That's great. Too many conservatives are losers, mm -hmm. right? They, they conserved the last liberal victory. And I heard someone say, that the problem with Americans, conservative Americans, is they're grill Americans. They just want to be left alone on their back porch and grill, right? Um, but uh, that's not the way leftists are. They have no um, desire or willingness to leave anyone alone. And uh, so one thing that I like about you, Jeff, um, especially like about you, is that you've gotten involved uh, yourself um, in you've rapidly gotten involved and taken a lot of steps. Um, you've got some recent experience here. What's some steps people can take? Well, as you know, I ran for office in the state of Texas to be in the state legislature specifically to change these laws. Mm -hmm. And I forced the uh, Republican establishment, the governor of Texas, the Speaker of the House in Texas, to spend over $3 million against me in this little podunk <laughs> legislative race because I had bills of impeachment prepared for family court judges one of them, Claire Shipman in my own county. Mm. Judge Shipman gave custody to, to a, the boyfriend of an ex-wife mm. when the ex-wife was killed. Dang. The ex-wife was killed in a, in a drunk driving accident. And the boyfriend she was living with at the time, she gave him visitation. 
It's crazy. It's crazy. So, uh, I, the, so there's a couple of things that I had a platform on family court reform. Mm -hmm. And the first thing was, um, we, in Texas, uh, this is gonna shock you, uh, temporary orders are not appealable oh, in Texas, wow. in family court. We have a special statute that the family lawyers did. You can't appeal temporary orders. So that's why- I, I thought Texas was a conservative state though. It, it's, a, it's peopled by conservatives, yeah. but it's ruled by liberals. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like a lot of places. Sure. Liberals are experts at subverting democratic institutions, right? Mm. So we can't appeal. So we need to make temporary orders appealable on the lower standard of appeal. All you can do is mandamus, which is a much higher proof standard. 95% of those plus are denied in Texas. It's such a high standard. Yeah. So make them appealable. Second thing is uh, clarify in statute the meaning of the fit parent presumption. Mm -hmm. Fit parent presumption exists in case law, but it's not written in statute. Mm -hmm. They don't want it written in statute because mm -hmm. it would take away judicial discretion mm -hmm. and give it to the parents. Mm -hmm. right? The other thing is we have an error in the federal and most of the state constitutions. If you read the Federalist Papers, uh, they believe that the, ju the judicial branch would be the weakest branch of government, and they worried that the other branches would gang up on it. So it's very difficult to remove a judge. Well, history has shown that they're wrong. They, the yeah. judicial branch is the most powerful branch of government. In fact, it bullies the other branches. Mm -hmm. So we need to make it much easier to impeach judges. Much, much easier. And I, do, I think also that I propose that in Texas, with the same signature requirements to get on the ballot, you could initiate a plebiscite to remove a district judge. Mm -hmm. So you could do removal votes for judges. That puts, that puts a lot of fear into them, right? Because this interrupts their retirement, even if it, even if it fails. And the, the, the final thing is to uh, enforce cameras in the courtroom. Yes. Every family yes. courtroom should be recorded on yes. cameras. Because, and this is gonna shock people here, mm -hmm. uh, court reporters lie too. Hmm. That's what I was wondering. Why, but court reporters lie all the time in the record. Old, I've had, I found it twice. And omit data. Yes. Fortunately, because of COVID, yeah. most of my hearings uh, for the last year and a half have been online, mm -hmm. and I've been able to find the fact that they lied in these records, right? But I wouldn't have been able to do that had it been an in-person hearing. So we need to record judges. And what Carnell talks about court watchers, we have a group in Texas, we put 50 people into these courtrooms, and you find that judges are very unwilling to commit felonies on the bench when there's 50 witnesses. Mm -hmm. Hmm. A lot of people don't know. In the, in the United States, I mean, it's funny that people don't know this. We have open courts in the United States. We don't have secret mm -hmm. courts. Every citizen has access to every court in the United States. Every citizen of this country should visit, regularly visit their district court to see that justice is being administered to your fellow citizens in your community. They should visit their federal district court, which is not uh, never far away. It's only a county away. Mm -hmm. Go visit, you know, once a year, go visit a federal district court and see how your federal district judge is doing. You have access to these courts and you are the only place that uh, the final say for all this. Now, that brings me to my final point about serving on juries. Now in Texas, we have jury, we have jury trials for family court. We're, I think we're the last one left. Well, the jury box is the only place left in our governments where the citizen can overrule the whole entire state. If you are a member of a jury, you can tell the state no. No matter how powerful the state is, no matter how powerful the prosecutor is, in the jury box, you are the government. So instead of thinking of it as jury duty, you should start thinking of it as a jury right. You have a right to ensure that the courts are administering, administering justice to your fellow citizens fairly, and no aspect of justice, I submit even, even criminal justice, is not as important as the justice that is administered for the care of children. Mm -hmm. And those are the most important cases you should be concerned with. Amen. Thank you for fighting, for, uh, fighting against tyranny and fighting for our families. Will you give them a round of applause, please? We have just a few minutes left, and I'm going to open it to a couple of questions from the audience. Um, and what I just ask is if you have a question, be sure it's a question, not a statement that you're looking for someone to agree with you with. Uh, so, uh, and when you uh, give your question, please let us know who you're asking, if you're asking the panel or a specific individual.
Yes, this is for Carnell. Be very close to the mic, but yeah, we can hear you. Just, yes. There you go. Uh, Carnell, regarding the, the time that it takes to submit the claim that you are not the father, can you give an example of how long that is? And, sure. and if it's something that's done clandestinely by the person you know, who's trying to commit the problem, I want to know how you would know. Like how you'd know about that, that she is trying to put the man under like false fatherhood for somebody. Over. Okay, okay, good question, good question. So time limits vary based on the, the, the use case scenario. So if you are single, unwed, not married, right? If you sign any document, whether you've seen my presentation, what I call a signed confession, voluntary acknowledgement of paternity, the Papa Opportunity Program, or a litany of other touchy-feely names, if you sign that document, the clock starts running. And you have, in many states, 60 days to figure out that if you sign this confession, you are now locked into this thing. And on the 61st day, she can get in your face and say, I tricked you, fool, and you're going to have to pay me. Because now it's going to take a judge's order to get you off of that, even if you got the recording of her saying well, me and my boyfriend figured that since you make more money than he does, you are a better candidate. Now, for the married men, um, there's this group called uh, the Governor of Commissioners. It's, it's a non-elected body. So the way they decided to tackle the challenging of paternity is they came up with this uh, statute of, of, of time limits that said anywhere from ages two to age five, if you don't find out by the child's second birthday, you are banned from ever challenging. And in the other states that have as high as five years, you're married, you're banned from ever challenging paternity. And I've been able to point out the hypocrisy of this before the legislators. I said, one, that is not a, 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 a duly appointed elected body. They should not be able to dictate over the citizens of a state who haven't had a voice in participating in the process to just manipulate men for money. And this also applies to teen boys. Second, there's an hypocrisy here. There's no requirement for the child's mother to disclose to the court, to her own attorney, or to the guy she's pointing at that there are multiple paternity candidates. And who's a multiple? Anyone that she's had intimate relations with during a 60-day window of conception can be the child's father. Um, I actually solved a case involving identical twins and my client using my formula called ABCs of Paternity in my book called Trapped by Law, I was able to prove my client was actually in Afghanistan in combat duty in the US Army as a sergeant at her time of conception. But yet, they had a DNA test that showed he was 99.999% the father. He said, man, it can't be. I, I, didn't, I haven't touched her since I've seen her. I told the guy, I says, man, when I see your DNA report, the probability is so high, there must be another guy who matches your DNA profile. Identical twin, triplets, quadruplets, something like that, because these are people who come from the same fertilized egg. Well, guess what? I say, any chance you got a twin brother? He's like, yeah. Well, where's your twin brother live? The twin brother lives near the girlfriend who put his name down. His married brother, turns out, based on the window of conception, was the only person within 30 miles of her. So guess, we got my guy off, we got him put on, and he was pissed about it. But these time limits about what the, you know, whether it's two years, five years, 60 days, 180 days, they are documented within the family code section of a state, but how many men and teen boys are being taught information about family law so they will have any awareness that there's a clock running and your ability to defend yourself and defend your rights, you could lose that sucker before you ever found out there was a time limit. So I believe that one, Men and boys should make, take the action to have zero children while you are unmarried and don't have any children till you're in a committed relationship with the woman who has your last name if you want to be in a relationship. No kids. Do not leave the decision 
in her hands because she has all these multiple options for uh, contraception and up to and including. And let's talk about the Roe v. Wade decision real quick. Senator Marco Rubio is, is making a push to say we should file for child support while the woman is pregnant. Some people are shocked that I am not upset at that idea. I said, you know what, that is a great idea. This could represent the personhood of the child while the child is yet in utero. And this is an opportunity after she's been pregnant for eight weeks, we now have through my business partner, we can get a DNA test, legal DNA test that doesn't endanger the pregnancy by getting a blood sample from the mother because at the eighth week, we now have enough fetal cells in her bloodstream to where now we can get a match of maternity to the mother and the child and the only person we have to get an external sample from is the alleged father. So he doesn't have to wait until birth now to find out does he have a financial responsibility. He can find out starting at the eighth week. So my push is, well look, now let's also recognize the rights of the fathers from day one and them not have to take any legal intervention actions to be recognized as a legal father and that has rights and access to the child. That would be what I would say. One more question. Sorry, two questions really quick. Um, a follow up to what you were just speaking on. Where can men go to educate themselves to understand the laws for the layman, which I think most of us are? And the second one for the panel, um, how do you gather evidence in a two-party state? Mm. So, that first question was to me? Let's start with the two-party. Let's yeah. start with the two-party okay. state yeah. one, okay. Melissa. So, Florida is a two-party state. Mm -hmm. I'm licensed in Florida as well. So, in a two-party state, what I tell my clients is you want to do everything in writing to the extent that you can. Put absolutely everything in writing. Okay? Um, most homes have security cameras, right? Security cameras, if you have a conversation on your front porch, if you have a conversation in your house, that's not, that's not violative of the rule. You're not recording the conversation. You're like, look, look, look. I, I was accused of saying X, Y, Z. She's in my home. Yep. I wasn't recording her, but my security cameras picked this up. So it's sort of a way to, to, to get around that. But unfortunately, let me say this too. Women will do this a lot, okay? Proximity is power text you, can we talk? Don't respond. We need to talk. What do you want? We need to talk in person. No, listen, that's a trap. Okay? After 12 years together, you know, this, we, we deserve a face-to-face -face conversation. No, it's a trap. Proximity is power, all right? Because it, especially if you're vulnerable to someone, if you're going through a divorce and they come in and, but Carnell, we've been together so long. Hey, women are very manipulative, they know. Yep. So you want to stay away, especially in a two-party state. You don't want to get yourself in a situation where there's a possible he said, she said. There are, there's apps, okay? There's My Family Wizard apps. There's different apps that you can use, actually, that go through the court that automatically record calls, okay? So if you can get those in place, then you don't violate the statute using a court-ordered app, okay? But in a two-party state, you want to limit everything to emails, to text messages, security cameras, public places where there's witnesses, because witnesses are still available, and use these apps. Um, but definitely, it's, it's harder in a two-party state, but there's still ways around that. Jeff, to the issue of where can men go uh, to start to educate themselves on these topics? I would send them to Carnell's website. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. Uh, I do, and I do that. Yeah, I do too. Um, and I, I will tell you, family codes are not that hard to understand. Nope. Um, the, the, of all the parts of the law that you'll ever find, they're written in the most plain English. Mm -hmm. Go to the family code in your state mm -hmm. and understand, and, and usually they follow pretty logically. They define their terms at the top, mm -hmm. then they start defining rights and duties of the judges and the parties and how the procedures work. And so go do that. But I think Carnell's made this point. You also need to watch some trials. Yep. The best way for you to learn how this works is to visit a family court and watch a couple of trials mm -hmm. and see how it actually works. Yes. Very helpful. Can we thank them one more time? Yeah.